Uh, let me circle back to that first story that we ran about uh, the AFP demanding mm -hmm. 60 million pesos in damages yes. from China over property damage mm -hmm. during the June 17 confrontation. We're not even talking about medical costs for that wounded yes, yes, Navy yes. seaman. How much of a legal basis do you think this would have? Well, the Philippines has very solid legal basis to claim compensation because really China, what, the, what China did uh, violates international law in so many different ways. So the country is therefore, that country is therefore internationally responsible or liable for its actions. First, it, uh, by doing so, it, it violated the sovereign immunity of the vessel. It is, after all, a Philippine Navy ship. Still, it, no matter how small it is, it has that sovereign immunity and is considered to be part of uh, the country. It represents the country, essentially. So the fact that they attacked it in that way uh, violated the sovereign immunity of the vessel. Second, uh, there was really no justification for what they did. Uh, the crew, the vessel, was not doing anything to them. So it was an, clearly an unprovoked attack, and it is attack uh, attended uh, with violence. So it is contrary to the principles of the UN Charter. It's an, it's an act uh, or use of force against a sovereign nation because, as I said, the vessel represents uh, the Philippines. So no matter how you look at it, no, uh, China is internationally responsible for that unprovoked uh, action. So, so, so they should pay. Yeah. So there's strong legal basis for it, but who adjudicates in this instance? How will we get that compensation? Well, it's not a matter of adjudication. It really now is uh, false to the diplomacy. No? And I suspect that this was probably one of the items that was uh, touched upon in the bilateral consultation meeting that they, had, they held the, the, uh, you know, what, the other day and yesterday, I think. Okay, um, what about the uh, reaction and the handling of the Philippines after the June 17 incident? I just wanted to, we haven't spoken in a while, mm -hmm. I just wanted to get your thoughts on how you think the Philippine government handled that. Well, I think, uh, of course, it could have been better, but then it seems like the Philippine government right now is also in a kind of transition with respect to the uh, agencies handling it uh, and the uh, decision making for it. No? So I think it's pretty clear that there, it's in that uh, period, so maybe it's attributable to that. Mm -hmm. Some would say that sending a Navy force to the resupply mission mm -hmm. um, is an escalation on our part. I mean, uh, because we could have sent our Coast Guard to mm -hmm. do its routine resupply, mm -hmm. but in the June 17 incident, we saw Navy SEALs mm -hmm. out there. No, I don't think it's an escalation because, you know, the color of the vessel and the markings on it is not what uh, uh, creates any tension. Clearly here, it's the activities of a vessel and its crew, uh, which is uh, the one that can be for a form of escalation. And we have not done anything like that. In fact, as we saw, there are only two uh, rubber boats, uh, basically, uh, that reached the Sierra Madre. They were already moored at the, uh, the side of the Sierra Madre, and they weren't taking any kind of aggressive actions against anyone. So it's not because they were they were navy vessels that it is uh, that it can be considered aggressive, and we have to we shouldn't forget the BRP Sierra Madre itself is a navy vessel. So it's only right that it be resupplied and attended to by a military or navy or uh, marine crew. No? So that is not a sound uh, reason, I think, and it distracts from the fact that all this time it really has been the other side that has been really incrementally escalating no? mm -hmm. from just a few ships to now tens or 20 ships basically against uh, maybe a few of ours no? uh, and all those actions like using a laser and now here using uh, knives and pickaxes of all mm. things. Do you no? think it's just coincident that, a coincidence then attorney that it came just a couple of days after you know we did file the continental shelf claim the extension? I think so I think so because uh, well the filing of the continental shelf claim that has been uh, that was recommended so many times before. Mm -hmm. I mean, even during the last uh, months of the Aquino administration, it was uh, again reiterated, and then we did it again with the Duterte administration, So, and again with the Marcos administration. It so happens that this time uh, it was approved. You know? So I don't think that there's any um, relationship between the timing of those uh, events. Can you help us understand uh, the concept of the continental shelf? Because we always mm -hmm. the territorial sea, EEZ, mm -hmm. and now we are hearing an extended continental mm -hmm. shelf uh, claim by the Philippines. What does this What does this give us exactly? Yeah. And well, why do we need to mm -hmm. claim this extended okay. continental shelf? Uh, first of all, it's an extension of the continental shelf. The continental shelf is basically about a claim to the natural resources of the seabed. Mm -hmm. 
it is not equivalent to a claim of sovereignty. Full and absolute sovereignty is basically unlimited power of the state over an area. Mm -hmm. But outside of uh, that area of sovereignty, meaning outside of the territorial sea, what we have are sovereign rights. And sovereign rights are basically property rights. Mm -hmm. What it means is that everything, uh, all the natural resources within that 200 miles first, uh, belongs to us. So it's the natural resources. It's, it's like, you know, any ordinary person does not ha need to have all of his personal property, his car, his books, etc. They don't have to be in his house for him to have control over it or to have rights over it and exercise uh, his property rights over it. So it's the same thing here, except that here we're talking about natural resources and international law basically grants the Philippines those rights, sovereign rights, which are exactly property rights, to any resources found in that area mm -hmm. of the continental okay. shelf. Initially, if you don't do anything, you're fully entitled to 200 nautical miles. Everything within 200 nautical miles is ours. But based on UNCLOS, it is possible for you to claim additional resources mm -hmm. in an extended continental shelf. So that's what we've done. We're also claiming rights to additional res seabed resources beyond 200 nautical miles, and they happen to fall uh, all within uh, the, the middle area of the South China Sea. But there are issues to this, chief of which is that Malaysia has mm -hmm. protested mm -hmm. the claim saying yes. that part of it encroaches on the Sabah territory. Yes. Well, it was expected. I mean, when we prepared the claim as part of the team, uh, we knew that there will be protests from all these other countries mm -hmm. because necessarily all the surrounding states do have uh, entitlements to the middle part of the South China Sea, the seabed, under the rules. And it's up to them to divide it amongst themselves. So what so, we've done is oh. simply clarified the extent to which we can claim. Um, Vietnam and Malaysia already did so back in 2009, and we already protested them before. So kumbaga ngayon, patas lang. We're all, mm. We've all made claims, we've all protested each other. And, but now that we're clear about the areas which we're claiming, no, we've drawn lines, we can now proceed to the next step, actually, of uh, having serious discussions about how do we divide this between us. So basically, uh, sa madaling salita, Professor, we did this and uh, filed this claim so that all everybody else's cards are on the table, yes. including ours, yes. and then we can proceed to properly. So kumbaga, it does actually help diplomacy yes. Yes. and talks and negotiations. Yes, because it's now more concrete what it is that we're talking about. It will be easier to negotiate an area when, when you know exactly what, mm. where the boundaries mm -hmm. are, where the overlaps are, are. Are coastal states the ones only entitled to an extended continental shelf? Yes, if they can prove that the seabed, either the shape of the seabed or the geology of the rocks of the seabed are of a certain, have certain characteristics which allow them to extend beyond 200 miles. When you say that you're prepared for Malaysia to protest, mm -hmm. what does that mean? You work in the filing, you worked in a counter uh, response? Uh, yes, in, yes. In anticipation because of their the, protest? Yes, because the standards for sort of uh, figuring out no, uh, up to where your claim uh, extends, those are all technical. So our mapping agencies can easily do the numbers and, and uh, calculate where our claim will extend, where theirs will. Attorney, and also, they already you? filed their claims, and so we knew that it would overlap on theirs. Can we just clarify, though, that uh, this has not like some sort of prerequisite or early work so that we can try to reclaim Saba again? So it has nothing to do uh, with no, that? No, no. Uh, because uh, all these claims basically uh, are projected from the land territory. Mm -hmm. So... Um, you, it doesn't go in reverse. Uh, the fact that you divide up the shelf area does not necessarily mean anything to the land territory. Okay. And, well, in fact, what, what can be done is that uh, since there are pending sovereignty claims, it's still possible for the three claimant countries here to enter into joint uh, exploration and development agreements over the overlapping mm -hmm. claim. That mm -hmm. is also allowed by international right. I, was reading, I, was, I was reading her tweets and it says uh, basically it was measured from the shoreline of... Mm -hmm. uh, Borneo or mm -hmm. Sabah. Uh, a part of how it. does that a part of it? So mm -hmm. how, how does that work? And can we just clarify, like how does the measurement work, and how, exactly how much time and mm -hmm. effort does it take to measure those geological features, like you mm -hmm. were saying, underwater? Like that's probably really deep mm -hmm. under. Yeah. Is it expensive? Well, it is expensive because you have to do the surveys of the seabed. Mm -hmm. uh, the minimum required is the, the exact shape, and that requires uh, surveys. For these projects, actually we did both uh, Benham Rice and um, West Palawan region. Mm -hmm. this, the, the research for this was done by Ram Namria uh, between 2007 and 2010, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So they did a lot of surveys. 
And then um, after all the service, that was the most expensive part because it's it's a ship going back and forth with all the you know crew and, and supplies and all the instrumentation. And then from around 2008, 2000, yeah, 2008, uh, the team had been convened to now use the data that was acquired and process it and do all the computations, etc. Uh, 2009, we finished the Benham Rice uh, submission. We had decided to do that first because it was uncontroversial. There were no other mm -hmm. claimants. And we successfully uh, defended the claim uh, before the Commission on the Limits of Continental Shelf. So they validated our findings in 2012. So the next part, the the uh, claim for West Palawan region, the draft had already been prepared, so we just finished the draft and then again recommended to the uh, to the, the three administrations, uh, kept recommending it that it be filed. No, uh, but it was fine. It was when the current administration uh, approved it that we then set out to finalize the actual uh, su submission. No? Mm -hmm. The data and, and the, the write up was already done. The uh, analysis was already done, and all the information was already collected. So it, it was really more a matter of, of tweaking, uh, especially the executive summary, which is now uh, available. Mm -hmm. hey, uh, what should we wait for? I mean, we filed the claim. Mm -hmm. Is this like the 2016 arbitral uh, mm -hmm. uh, award that was given to us? Are we going to wait for something like that? Mm -hmm. Or uh, this is just a point for discussion and negotiation? No, it's more the second part because uh, the CLCS is not an adjudicating body. Mm -hmm. And if a submission is disputed, the policy is to set it aside and let the parties settle it first mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's only the states which can actually settle disputes and the CLCS has no power to do that. To do that. So we knew that as well. Uh, and so what this, what this does is open up uh, the table again for negotiations between the Southeast Asian claimants especially because they're the ones that have the valid claims. So it's basically setting up parameters for further negotiations yes. and settlements yes. between concerned countries. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, I want to come back to our top story about the damages that the Philippines, that the mm -hmm. EFP is asking China to pay. We mm -hmm. now have a response from the Chinese side, mm -hmm. fresh mm -hmm. off the presses. Uh, this is from Chinese spokesperson Mao Ning. She says the Philippine vessels were carrying out an illegal mm -hmm. resupply mm -hmm. mission which violated China's territorial waters and staging mm -hmm. a provocation sick. There's a bit of a grammatical error there. And staging a provocation when stopped by China Coast Guard, who acted lawfully and rightfully to defend China's sovereignty. The Philippine side should face the consequences of its own action. That is her response to the mm -hmm. AFP saying they mm -hmm. are seeking 60 million pesos or a million dollars in damages. Mm -hmm. Not surprising, think? since they <laughs> think that we're under them. Mm. <laughs> and they think they can uh, uh, charge us, like, uh, you know, uh, make us... Uh, um, liable for actions that they took against us. So, so we're not going to get anything, yeah. in short? Probably. As you said, Probably. this, this comes I mean, down to the diplomacy. It, yes, it comes down to diplomacy because in the end, uh, China also has to consider that, you know, what it did, mm -hmm. and the, the whole world knows it and then see mm -hmm. uh, these videos, etc. No? Uh, and it has implications about, you know, what, what, what are its implications to China's reputation and its sincerity in engaging in any kind of activity out there at sea. What, is, what does that imply for China and whether it respects the sovereign immunity of other states? No? So if it's smart, if it's smart, then it should consider this and possibly pay compensation as a way of uh, precisely de-escalating and also re-establishing good relations with the Philippines. Don't you think that was the route already uh, in the recent uh, BCM, bilateral consultation mechanism, or was that just routine. I mean, this being held twice a year mm -hmm. since 2016. Uh, well, what did you read in, in, in the statements of both China and the Philippines? Yeah. Are we headed somewhere with this bilateral mm -hmm. meeting? Well, I think based on the statements, as vague as they are, at least they're not the same as the other statements from previous, where, where they just kept recycling and moving and shuffling phrases around. Uh, I think that at least from this recent BCM, it seems that both parties really are interested in finding ways to move away from this brink that they've reached. No? Because what we've seen is really that uh, China is now using force against the Philippines. But when you study and the two statements, attorney, mm -hmm. the, the China would say that the still say in their mm -hmm. official statement from the BCM that we did infringe on their 
territory and we uh, provoke them. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the same time, they will say that, you know, we do respect each other's stance. Mm -hmm. So it's also a bit uh, contradictory. There's well, some elements of... Uh, that go against each other in there. That is the Chinese diplomatic language. So <laughs> it's always like that. Okay. No, so uh, no surprises there. But I think uh, what we need to look at now is basically the actions of, of China after this. No? Um, it, it is indeed hard because you also have like, you know, uh, the mouthpieces of China, that, mm -hmm. uh, the, that, that's the one that, that really pollutes the air and the atmosphere. Um, but. Uh, and you can expect, of course, that China will not immediately change the phraseology or the attitude of their MOFA spokesperson. Those are really designed no, to, to put up this show of, of absolute strength and confidence, etc. So what we need to look at basically will be facts on the ground and mm. actions on the ground. Uh, if, if it changes, then perhaps that is a better indicator of uh, sincerity on their part. There are two schools of thought as to whether the June 17 incident should have invoked the Mutual Defense Treaty. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, obviously, the uh, Malacanang sought mm -hmm. to try to downplay it, uh, first with Executive Secretary Lucas Persamin saying it was a misunderstanding and an accident, but later on corrected by Defense Secretary mm -hmm. Gibot Theodora saying it wasn't, it was a deliberate attack, mm -hmm. uh, but still falling short of invoking the MDT. Mm -hmm. On the other side of it, you have the analysts saying that like, they should have mm -hmm. triggered it given that the Article 3 or 4 mm -hmm. of the MDT says that when you trigger it, it doesn't mean that yeah. America is sending its warship immediately yeah. to come fight with us. It means you mm -hmm. start a process of consultation mm -hmm. between the U.S. and the Philippines to discuss how to yeah. respond to these incidents. Where do you stand? Uh, I stand on the fur... No. No, I'm not sure which side you're... But Somewhere basically, in the middle. Yeah, no, no, no. Basically, okay. Uh, it falls down to what you mean by triggering the MDT. Okay, uh, because for me, there's no need to trigger the MDT. It's as if the, the MDT is like a light switch you turn mm. on and off. And that's not the correct understanding of how it works. The MDT there is active. Uh, it has been used. It's the whole reason why we have Balikatan exercises in ERCA. No? I mean, the MDT does not need to be triggered. What people usually think of when you say trigger the MDT is that uh, when you invoke it, hostilities will now begin, mm. war will mm. begin. Correct. That one, I don't think that that is the intention. Um, we have actually used the MDT because immediately after the incident, there are already close uh, discussions between the Philippines and the United States through their, through their ambassador. So that has actually been uh, already used and activated, and I think they were still uh, discussing it uh, even up to now. No? So, so it's, it's not that. No? I think what people uh, should understand is that, uh, you know, when a use of armed force, you know, an unlawful use of force is uh, undertaken as against a state, what should be the appropriate response? Is it full-scale hostilities or war, uh, invoking self-defense or collective self-defense under the UN Charter? I think that in this instance, even international law would not, uh, would not agree with using that single incident. You know, serious as it may be, having resulted in a loss of a finger, that is not enough to initiate a full-scale war between two countries. No? Uh, even in international law, there's, there's, there are standards uh, of uh, proportionality and reasonability to, to consider. The response should be proportional. Um, and, you know, war over the loss of a finger is not, but, simply not going to be But if nothing else, it sends a signal, it sends mm -hmm. a message to China. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, Washington keeps talking about how they have an ironclad mm -hmm. commitment to the Philippines, mm -hmm. but have yet to show much for it. Yeah, but the pr the proper the, what, what would be the proportional response to the loss of a finger? Are we going to ask them for another finger <laughs> in, the, in return? So Actually, it's not, I was, it doesn't work that way. I was going to say there was a third school of thought where mm -hmm. I was just reading an article earlier today, and the fact that our our officials are always in constant communication, those phone calls, right, mm -hmm. between the peers, between the, somewhere, someone in the defense establishment here and there, may, may it be the Secretary of Defense here and the mm -hmm. Secretary of Defense there. That's already Article 3 of the MDT. Yes. So basically, that's also kind of how you see things, yes. Yes. that we are actually we invoking are actually, it already. Yes, we're actually mm -hmm. using it. Uh, and that's why we have to distinguish between, you know, the misunderstanding that triggering the MDT means we're going to start hostilities mm. and basically triggering the MDT in the sense that, okay, we're going to make use of mechanisms in the MDT. Mm. And in the MDT, 
there are several possible mechanisms, including consultations, to talk about what uh, responses could be made jointly with, uh, through the alliance. And this can be um, um, actions like economic, diplomatic, etc. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, if we were to decide that in order to respond to this kind of incident, uh, both the Philippines and the U.S. should now call on their friends and allies in the world to discredit this Coast Guard, remove its accreditation, no, and call them out for being a maritime danger agency instead of a safety agency, then that would be a proportional response, okay. I think. Uh, the Philippine government has already said that they will not be afraid to uh, self-defend themselves mm -hmm. in the next resupply mission. Mm -hmm. Use um, the same level of force. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Taking a look at the June 17 mm -hmm. incident, what would be the proportionate response mm -hmm. in terms of self-defense there? Well, uh, again, um, if we if we go by, for example, the standards for maritime law enforcement, there are standards which say that if it's a non-lethal action, then the response should also be non-lethal. It should not cross the threshold mm -hmm. of lethality. Uh, it all depends on the rules of engagement, which are the instructions given to these uh, units mm -hmm. on how they should respond to specific actions taken against them. But self-defense definitely will, will involve uh, probably some standards for what we call the graduated use of force. Mm -hmm. So there also has to be some actions that trigger uh, greater or uh, more well, reasonably greater response in order to prevent no, no I perceive you know, yes but then that also means we, we should bring pickaxes perhaps and international oh. law will allow for that yes yes because again the standard is simply proportional and reasonable mm. and here if a pickaxe is being used uh, and you do believe that it's about to cause serious injury or death then that's the time that a lethal response may be warranted. It all depends on the situation. Okay, Attorney, real quickly, in line with that, a lot of uh, analysts that we have talked to also, one of their suggestions was to use the MBT to request for uh, U.S. patrol boats to escort the RORA missions in order to ensure success. Now, in the spirit of the escalation, mm -hmm. which we're is where we're at right now. What do you think about that suggestion? Would that be inflammatory? Would that be a good idea? Would that be a better idea than uh, going hand-to-hand -hand combat? Uh, perhaps it would, uh, but I think the policy of government right now is uh, to avoid that because it's, it might present an image of uh, weakness or mm. lack of determination. On the other hand, it is something that China, al China will absolutely hate to happen. So maybe that is, the, <laughs> that is uh, the route to take if you want to piss them off. In a real your thoughts on Senator Amy Marcus's uh, uh, mm. hypersonic yeah. missiles? That, that China <laughs> is aiming to target us with hypersonic missiles. 25 targets uh, mapped out in the Philippines. Uh, alarmist speculation meant to induce panic, I think, because hypersonics are not meant for those types of targets. I mean. China already has the Philippines, the entire Philippine range, uh, within range of its short range and medium range and intermediate range ballistic missiles. They don't need to use hypersonics mm -hmm. against us. And in addition, since 2017, about uh, a third of the Philippines is already within the range of missiles from their artificial island bases. Mm -hmm. So, so they don't, it doesn't don't, matter whether there's a hypersonic or not. It's superfluous. <laughs> they don't need to waste their hypersonic yeah. missiles on us. Yeah. <laughs> all right, we that are going to have to leave that there for tonight. Thank you so much for all your insights. Very enlightening. Dr. J. Professor, Attorney J. Batumbaka, Director of the UP Institute of Maritime Affairs and Law of the Sea. Mm -hmm.